Tonight, we have with us Richard Schaus. Uh, he's going to talk about uh, the book that he co-authored with Thomas Ryan, Lee is Trapped and Must Be Taken. Richard Schaus is a Sergeant Major, U.S. Army retired. He served on active duty for more than 30 years in a variety of Army and Joint Military Intelligence assignments, both at home and abroad. Rick is a lifelong student of the Civil War and uh, also American military history in general and the Gettys Gettysburg campaign in particular. He has written more than 100 articles and book reviews on Civil War subjects for newspapers and magazines over the past 21 years. And since 2011, he is the writer of a weekly column entitled Civil War Profiles for the Coastal Point newspaper in Ocean View, Delaware. So with that, I am going to turn the screen over to our guest author. Thank you very much. Uh, if I make one brief correction, the last part of your description was talking about uh, co-author Tom Ryan. He uh, lives in Delaware and he is the, uh, oh. <laughs> he's the big author and uh, he writes for the Coastal Review at uh, Bethany Beach in uh, Delaware. Uh, he is also a um, former Department of the Army civilian with intelligence, many years of intelligence experience. So, but he gets the credit for all the articles and the uh, Coastal Point articles. So just wanted to make sure, I don't want to take credit that I'm not due. <laughs> Got you, sorry about that. That's all right, not a problem. I would like to first uh, thank Kelly for the opportunity to speak before your group. Uh, we're in strange and uncharted waters. So fortunately we do have the Zoom features and various other remote capabilities that allow us to continue to uh, do what I prefer to do in person, but certainly uh, will utilize this means of communication and hopefully um, interest uh, folks in the subject material of our book and uh, give you a, an overview uh, description of the contents of the book in hopes that you will go ahead and, and read it at some point uh, in time later after, after tonight. Uh, I do have a presentation which I will start momentarily uh, a slideshow which will accompany my uh, presentation and we will go to that right now. This is the cover of the book. The artwork was uh, when we were actually beginning to, to write this and put it together I remembered a Edwin Forbes painting that depicted the pursuit of Lee's army by General Meade's army after the Battle of Gettysburg and thought that it would be a, it would make a good cover art. And the folks at Savas Beatty, the publisher, they put together the art along with the, the writing uh, on this. And we're very happy. We really like the way it turned out. So this is, that is the cover of the book. It is the 11 fateful days after the Battle of Gettysburg from July 4th, the day after the battle ended, which we know now, but they did not know that at the time, to the 14th of July, which was a day that General Lee uh, cross, recrossed back into West Virginia and then Virginia after the battle and successfully uh, withdrew his army across the Potomac after his defeat at Gettysburg, which was a significant accomplishment considering uh, what General Lee had to work with in terms of the number of men that he moved uh, along with supplies and Union prisoners of war that he successfully accomplished that. Uh, and we covered the 11 days, those 11 days primarily from the aspect of the Union Army uh, Kent Masters and Brown wrote Retreat from Gettysburg, which covered it from the Confederate standpoint. And when Tom and I were looking into possible subjects for the book, we recognized that the Union aspect, the Union view of those days 
the 4th to the 14th of July really had not been covered in any detail, certainly not to the extent that uh, Kent Brown covered it in his. So we set out to provide a comprehensive and detailed account from the Union Army, from the standpoint of General Meade's army, of those important days, which were more what could have happened than what actually did happen, which is a major subject of the book, um, General Meade's uh, efforts to uh, pursue or follow uh, General Lee's retreating army after the battle, and the expectation that he would uh, engage General Lee's army at some point uh, to prevent Lee's successful crossing of the Potomac back into the safety of Virginia, or at least um, deal him more serious injury, uh, considering that he had been badly uh, beaten up, if you will, at Gettysburg for three days. And hopefully the hope was, especially um, by the President of the United States, Abraham Lincoln, that General Meade would be able to engage General Lee again and deal him significant damage, if not uh, impelling, impelling him to surrender at some point before Lee could get back across the river. And the book goes into the details of exactly what happened and what didn't happen. At, on the 4th of July, um, General Meade was uncertain of what General Lee intended to do. After three days of fighting at Gettysburg, um, General Lee, whose army maintained the offensive at Gettysburg, uh, had made a, a fateful, another fateful thing, a fateful assault on the Union line on the third, which is primarily known to history as Pickett's Charge, uh, which utilized more than just General Pickett's division, uh, and was under the command, tactical command of Lee's Corps Commander, General James Longstreet. General Lee made the determination after the failure of the attack on the third that due to a number of factors, he would retreat the following day. So on the 4th of July, the preparations were seriously undertaken and Lee began plans to disengage his army from the Gettysburg battlefield and move back south to the area of Williamsport and Hagerstown. And from there, he would cross the Potomac back into the safety of Virginia and thus ending, which would end the campaign of Gettysburg as we know it today. The one factor that General Lee was certainly not certain of was what his opponent, General George Meade, commanding the Army of the Potomac, whether he would let him accomplish this or whether he would take action to try and prevent Lee from successfully withdrawing from Gettysburg. Um, Lee, of course, felt that certainly that Meade might try to impede the retreat because it's pretty hard to keep um, a retreat of that significance, a withdrawal of an army of somewhere around, oh, at the time, probably about 50,000 men to include supplies, wounded and Union prisoners of war. He could not keep that a secret. So Lee basically, unlike his opponent, Lee was in command of the army and he was alone in the decision-making process. Jefferson Davis, uh, certain military leaders in Richmond, where the museum is located, is, were not in communication with General Lee. He was not impeded by any directions or orders from, from Richmond, from the Confederate high command which was totally opposite the condition of his opponent, General Meade. So General Lee determined and began the process of retreating, moving his army, the withdrawal from the Gettysburg battlefield down towards Williamsport and Hagerstown. Jefferson Davis, as I said, president of the Confederacy, um, had great faith in General Meade's capabilities, had certainly expected uh, that the Battle of Gettysburg, which they were barely hearing information about, would be successful. Um, basically, the, the command in, in Richmond were unaware of the events with any certainty that had taken place. Even on the 4th of July, very little information was reaching the southern capital about the results or what was going on in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, far to the north. 
So, and again, General uh, President Davis would provide no immediate uh, leadership or direction orders to General Lee. So General Lee was basically on his own, but that was fine with Davis because he had great faith in, in General Lee's capabilities. On the opposite side of the lines was the Army of the Potomac, which was basically occupied a, an interior type of line, uh, a horseshoe line is what it's tradition, traditionally referred to. This army was commanded by General, Major General George Gordon Meade. Meade had assumed command, been actually been directed to assume command uh, by President Lincoln and General Halleck on the 28th of June. So the battle was fought very soon after Meade did assume command. Fortunately for Meade, he was well familiar with the army. He had served with the Army of the Potomac uh, from the Peninsular Campaigns in, in spring of 62. Um, he was wounded in one of the fights, uh, but returned to the army and was present for all of the major battle, battles between the Peninsular Campaign and what would be the Geta Battle of Gettysburg shortly after he was put in command. Part of the reason Meade was given command was because he was familiar with the army and they knew Lincoln, Halleck, and, and pretty much everybody in the Union High Command knew that there would be a battle shortly and they wanted a commander who was at least familiar with the army. So Meade had commanded the Fifth Corps prior to the, his assumption of command so he was familiar with his other fellow Corps commanders as well as um, his own Fifth Corps. So while the command actually being the guy on the top and in command where the buck stopped was new to Meade and certainly would be reflected in his personality, how he assumed the role of the leader, the commander throughout the battle and in the period that the book covers but on the 4th of July, General Meade was uncertain as to what General Lee would do, what action he would take. And he intended to basically let Lee still maintain the initiative. Meade would watch what Lee was doing. He would make small reconnaissance, push a few of his corps forward, uh, small elements of his corps, various corps forward, just to see what was happening. But he would not bring on any further engagement. So essentially with Lee intending and beginning his withdrawal and General Meade waiting to see what Lee did, we had the 4th of July would be the day after the battle. The battle would end with the great assault, um, Longstreet's assault on the 3rd of July and that would end the battle other than the usually deadly and continually deadly skirmishing which would take place at Gettysburg. It wasn't necessarily quiet there, but General Meade would not actively uh, engage General Lee's army. He would wait to see what General Lee was doing. Meade was a cautious commander. He was hesitant because he was new in command. So he would wait to see what his opponent was doing. And both sides had suffered serious losses. Uh, Meade had more men in reserve. He had. He had suffered actually about the same amount of casualties, but he had a larger army. So his army still maintained a more offensive capability than General Lee's did. General Lee had every unit in his army engaged and had suffered a, a significant losses proportionally to the smaller size of his troops. So Meade would watch and see, make his determination of gen what General Lee was doing. The retreat began on the 4th. Um, certainly, obviously, General Lee would have to move his what supplies he had acquired and was still still sending south um, to, the, to the Confederacy. And in addition to supplies, he had a considerable number, uh, we're not certain how many, he had a considerable number of wounded who were able to be moved or were hopefully able to be moved, who would accompany the army south uh, to the safety of the Confederacy. These men would, many would die along the way and many others who were not capable of being moved 
would remain at Gettysburg under the care and in field hospitals under the care of a number of surgeons and soldiers who remained in Gettysburg to help care for the wounded. But somewhere around eight, 10,000 Confederate wounded would make the attempt, the long trip in every type of wagon, uh, any conveyance they could find, some probably who were lightly wounded would be on foot, um, trying to get as many of his ambulatory wounded as he could, because General Lee knew that manpower was very short in the South, and for every soldier that could make it back and recover, there's a possibility he might be back um, in, in the Army and back on, in Lee's command at some point later. So they were trying to take everyone they could. And in addition, we had approximately 5,000 uh, Union prisoners of war who had been captured by the Confederates during the three-day battle. Uh, they had not accepted paroles, which was illegal for them to do so at Gettysburg. So they would be under escort and they would have to move south also. So this was between four and 5,000 Union POWs who Lee's army was responsible for and he would have to get down so they would end up in uh, prison camps and various prisons uh, in the Richmond area and other areas of the South. So General Meade would observe from various observation points and signal stations, uh, the beginning of these movements, the retreat of the Confederates. Now Meade, unlike General Lee had close contact with his commanders because naturally Washington was somewhat closer. That commander, his immediate military commander was General Henry Halleck, who was the general of the armies. He was more of a desk officer than a field officer. His, one of his nicknames was Old Brains. Uh, he was not looked on overly favorably by subordinate commanders, the field commanders. Uh, Halleck had spent very little time as a field commander, but uh, President Lincoln had a lot of faith in Halleck's ability as a knowledgeable officer, more of a strategic commander than a tactical commander. But he would issue orders, Halleck would issue orders to General Meade. And of course, General Meade was responsible for carrying those orders out. So with telegraph service to various points uh, Frederick, Maryland, and um, other points from there, couriers would ride to Gettysburg with message traffic from Washington, D.C. for General Meade, and he would get that traffic fairly soon, as opposed to General Lee, who would not be getting any guidance uh, from high command in Richmond. So General Halleck and the Commander-in-Chief, President Abraham Lincoln, had fairly quick communications with General Meade. Uh, General Meade had not established telegraphic communications at Gettysburg. Uh, there are a number of reasons for that, which were partial to the particular to the battle and not for our study here. But Meade would have telegraphic communication with Washington during the course of the 14 of those 11 days between the 4th and the 14th of July. So there's ra regular communication between General Meade and President Lincoln and General Halleck. Uh, for Meade's part, he was not overly happy with all this guidance he was receiving. As a field commander, he felt that he knew better what was happening on the battlefield and during his pursuit his movements uh, to follow General Lee's retreating army. So not all of what General Meade was receiving from General Halleck and President Lincoln was well received. Uh, he had his own views of what he should be doing and what he wanted to do versus what the President and General Halleck expected him or would order him, want him to do uh, in terms of bringing Lee to battle again and uh, inflicting more damage, if not the general surrender of Lee's army, mainly if they could trap them uh, north of the Potomac. On the 4th of July, there was no expectation that if Lee began a serious retreat and withdrawal from Gettysburg, he would be impeded in any way from successfully withdrawing his army down to the Potomac and across. Um, General Meade would eventually send Union cavalry 
to meet to not to cut off Lee's retreat, but to harass his wagon trains which meant that General Jeb Stewart, commanding Confederate cavalry, would operate his cavalry, cavalry to prevent that, to protect Lee's trains and to keep the probing eyes of the Union cavalry from gaining any information on exactly what Lee's intent was. But pretty much after the fourth, and fourth, fifth, sixth, it was generally determined that General Lee certainly was in retreat and was heading for Williamsport um, and Hagerstown, but Williamsport would be the crossing point. And that's the same point where he had crossed into Maryland uh, at the beginning, early in the campaign when he moved into Maryland and Pennsylvania. General John M. Bowden was a mainly irregular cavalry commander. He commanded a brigade of Western troops from basically from West Virginia and Western Virginia. Um, and he was tasked by General Lee to command one of the wagon trains, the wagon train with the majority of the Confederate wounded. And Imboden learned of this uh, late on the third and then took action and escorted the first wagon train of Confederate wounded uh, with his troopers. This, he was basically one of the only units that had was fresh he had arrived uh, with his command on the 3rd of July and had not been engaged in the battle. So of the available Confederate forces, Imboden's cavalry was one of the few units that was basically unengaged and was fairly fresh. They would escort the wagon train of the wounded. And just to give you an idea of how much effort was involved, this wagon train, just one of many wagon trains, was 17 miles long which is phenomenal when you think of it, because it began to rain beginning on the 4th of July, and the roads that they were taking were not improved. They were not good roads. Most were just mud, and the rain and all the wagon traffic would simply turn them into quagmires, and the travel for those who were on foot and even those in wagons, uh, those wounded suffered terribly, and many died along the way. Um, those bodies which were left along the route of the retreat, uh, many accounts recorded them being left at various farms because they couldn't go on or they would just be left um, for the care of the local uh, inhabitants uh, after they had passed away. So General Imboden was tasked and did a successful, did a very good job of escorting the wagon train to get it to Williamsport, Maryland. This is a colonel in the Union Army. He is Colonel Sharp. Colonel Sharp headed, headed the intelligence effort, which would include identifying what was going on and what General, Me, General Lee was, was doing in his, when he began withdrawing. Colonel Sharp commanded what was known as the Bureau of Military Information. This was a a far thinking organization that utilized what we would today call all source intelligence. Uh, Colonel Sharp's organization would take cavalry information, reports from prisoner interrogations. He had scouts actually operating behind the lines disguised as Confederate soldiers or civilians who would gather information. Um, his organization was very effective the one problem that he ran into was the fact that General Meade was basically not aware up until he assumed command of Sharp's, op Sharp's operation because he had worked for General Hooker, who was Meade's predecessor in the command of the Army of the Potomac. Meade was relatively unaware of, of, Meade's oper of Gen uh, Colonel Sharp's operation with the Bureau of Military Information, the BMI. But throughout this period, Colonel Sharp would provide General Meade with very accurate and very good timely information as to the whereabouts of General Lee's army, what the report said, what his scouts came back with and reported about um, General Lee's intentions and where his people were, where his troops were, the conditions of the area, uh, the general area. So Meade did have the advantage of an excellent 
uh, intelligence branch working for him who would keep him informed as best possible. And in the book, we do com complete uh, include some of the message traffic between Colonel Sharp and General Meade. For the following three days, the fourth, fifth, and sixth, these three days primarily involved the retreat of Lee's army, which was basically in the direct route towards Williamsport and Hagerstown. On the 4th of July, General Meade um, had a meeting with his corps commanders and would make the determination that he would not directly pursue General Lee's army, that they any pursuit could be bottled up uh, and prohibited from stopped by a very small number of Confederate troops that they moved through the various mountain passes. And so Meade and his commanders, Meade asked his commanders and they basically agreed that they would follow a parallel course uh, in flanking, essentially flanking and following uh, Lee's army. General Meade would just to make the determination to have a small, to have a force which basically included the Sixth Corps to begin with, uh, an entire army corps directly following Lee, but the rest of the army would follow on a parallel course, which meant that he would be going over a lot more territory and he would have to cross a lot, go move a lot farther if he was to hopefully have any chance of catching up with Lee before he recrossed the Potomac. So Union troops, if they were going to catch Lee, they would have to march longer, farther, and faster than Lee's army. Uh, it, to their benefit, they did not have wagon trains full of supplies and wounded and uh, Union prisoners of war impeding them. The Union forces could just move and would just be able to march uh, in pursuit of an along a parallel course as determined by General Meade. Now on the other side of the line, as Lee's retreat began, he relied on his three corps commanders, infantry corps commanders, to get their corps safely and to move south and to uh, provide any defensive operation if, if they were threatened by Union forces. The first corps commander, General James Longstreet, the senior corps commander, um, he was the singular officer that General Lee would rely on from an infantry standpoint um, to protect and defend General Lee's retreat, his army. The second corps was Richard Ewell. General Ewell's first battle had been Gettysburg. Uh, he had not been overly successful in his performance, but he would, he would command the second corps and take charge of his men on that on the withdrawal, the retreat from Gettysburg. The third corps was General A.P. Hill. His troops had actually begun the Battle of Gettysburg. He was somewhat indisposed early on, but he would command his third corps during the withdrawal. One of the more important commanders uh, who would be basically be tasked to provide the direct um, opposition to Union cavalry who would attempt to harass and destroy Lee's trains, as well as gather information, was General Jeb Stewart. Uh, there's been a lot of controversy regarding Stewart's role in the Battle of Gettysburg, but he and his troopers would perform admirably during this time period, during these 11 days, in protecting the Confederate withdrawal and screening um, Lee's withdrawing troops from prying eyes and, and Union cavalry. So Stuart did a lot to redeem what had been a blow to his reputation uh, at the Battle of Gettysburg. If we move to the other lines again, General John Sedgwick was the Corps Commander, the Sixth Corps Commander in the Union Army. General Meade tasked General Sedgwick to follow Lee's army uh, directly to basically to make sure what everybody believed, but Meade was not convinced that General Lee was actually retreating. And General Sedgwick would take his corps, which had been 
very lightly engaged at Gettysburg. So it was basically an intact corps of around 13,000 men and directly pursue Lee. This pursuit did not last very long. And General Meade made it clear to General Sedgwick that he did not want Sedgwick to engage General Lee again, even if he had the opportunity. If you leave him alone, he will probably leave you alone, was the way that Meade put it to Sedgwick. Uh, after just a short period of time in pursuit, General Meade would, would, would recall General Sedgwick to join in the movement of the Union Army parallel to Lee's army, and a small Union force would be tasked to follow Lee directly. And this was commanded by one of uh, General Sedgwick's brigade commanders who had some artillery with him and a cavalry brigade. They would be tasked to follow directly Lee's army and General Sedgwick and the Sixth Corps would rejoin the pursuit of Lee with the rest of the Army of the Potomac. As we move on to the, the next days, the fifth, the fifth, the sixth, and the seventh. On the 5th of July, um, General Herman Haupt, who we see in the slide here, he was in charge of the military railroad in this area. And he had done an admirable job of, admirable job of keeping the railroads running and supplying General Meade's army. He did a very good job of this. He was also a, um, classmate of General Meade's at West Point. So General Haupt felt that he could talk to Meade uh, more easily than other generals could. So on the 5th of July, he arrived in Gettysburg and found out where General Meade's headquarters was. And he traveled and discussed uh, the situation with General Meade. And what General Haupt was worried about, that even though the word was starting to reach General Meade that the Potomac River had swollen from the rains and was actually not fordable. And on the 4th of July, the day before, Union cavalry had mostly destroyed, partially destroyed the only pontoon bridge that Lee had at Falling Waters, which is just down the river from Williamsport. So as it was turning out, Lee was not able to withdraw his troops as quickly as he has intended. The only crossing was only by a ferry, which was a couple of ferry boats at Williamsport. So it was very slow. And the opportunity as Haupt saw it was that he thought that General Meade would be able to catch up with General Lee because of the condition of the Potomac River. Haupt told that to General Meade. General Meade certainly did not give him the reply he ex expected and said that uh, he would not be able to. His army was tired. They needed to be resupplied. Uh, General Haupt was not overly pleased with what he had heard because he could see, he could envision General Lee actually, despite the condition of the river and the loss of the pontoon bridge, he saw that General, he thought that General Lee would be able to cross the river. He told me that Lee had good engineers and they would be able to get a bridge rebuilt, fixed, and they would be able to cross. Um, he left Gettysburg and left General Meade, his old classmate, somewhat uh, discouraged about what he had heard and would take his discouragement and his comments, his beliefs back to Washington. And he would talk to General Halleck and President Lincoln and say that he believed that General, General Lee would be able to successfully cross the river before General Meade would be able to catch up with him. So to add to Meade's discontent, his old classmate was um, actually stirring up the authorities in Washington to uh, make every effort, and they would in the message traffic, to encourage me to move fast, to engage Lee uh, before he could cross the river. In, Lee, in General Meade's headquarters, his chief of staff was General Daniel Butterfield. Now, Meade was not particularly a fan of General Butterfield, but because Butterfield was, as chief of staff, was very familiar with the army, Meade kept Butterfield on as his chief of staff uh, after General Hooker resigned and Meade took command of the army. General Butterfield uh, was wounded by a spent shell fragment on the 3rd of July, and apparently he was not in he was suffering a lot of pain. He wasn't seriously wounded, but the bruising that he received was enough to keep him, finally to cause him to 
uh, have to give up his position as chief of staff and move away from the army to get to rest and recuperate. During the course of these 11 days, Meade would have three chiefs of staff. First one was a duo, General Governor, Governor Warren, who was the chief engineer of the Army of the Potomac. He would act as a co-chief of staff along with General Alfred Pleasanton, who was the commander of the Cavalry Corps of the Army of the Potomac. Um, General Warren, very capable, very knowledgeable. General Pleasanton was a little bit less so. He took a lot of credit and um, Meade liked Pleasanton, but Pleasanton's uh, service to Meade was somewhat lacking. His cavalry, instead of taking opportunities to cut off Lee's retreat, would simply try to harass um, Lee's trains. So Pleasanton and Warren would take over as co-chiefs of staff during this point and during this time period. And on the 6th of July, one of Pleasanton's cavalry division commanders, General John Buford, had been tasked to ride his, take his three brigades to Williamport and capture the city, capture the town of Williamsport and prevent Lee from escaping. Uh, Buford would do this, but his attack would be repulsed by General Imboden and many of the wounded who were beginning to reach uh, Williamsport, they would all actually get out of the wagons, wounds and all, and participate in the repulse of General Buford's uh, three brigades. So that was an effort that was very, um, it could have been a disaster for General Lee's army because he had wagon after wagon after wagon, uh, literally thousands of wagons backed up at Williamsport waiting to cross on these two ferry boats. So as you can imagine, it was taking a long time to uh, cross the river. And in the meantime, Lee would have to form a defensive position, which he did. And again, this is the cover art a uh, little, this is what is on display and from the Library of Congress of the Union Army in pursuit by parallel courses through the rain, catching up, trying to catch up to uh, Lee's army. The third chief of staff was General Andrew Atkin Atkinson Humphreys, who would hold that position for more time than the others. He would take command, he would take over as the chief of staff on the 8th of July. And during this time period, the, for, the, for the Union Army, the 7th and the 8th and the 9th of July were basically marching, hard marching, especially on the 7th and the 8th. They got off to a late start. Uh, the Corps would not have a lot of opportunity, but they would march far, they would march hard, and they would march in very difficult conditions to try to stay even with and catch up if there was a possibility with Lee's army at Williamsport. During the course of the battle and after the battle, General Meade basically had an open ability to appoint any commanders that he might need to appoint to Corps command to make up for commanders who were wounded or unavailable, or even if he didn't like them. During the course of the 11 days, and actually prior to that, General Meade would appoint three corps commanders. General William French, shown here, would command the third corps after General Daniel Sickles was wounded at Gettysburg and uh, had left the army. General John Newton would command the first corps Meade would replace General Doubleday, who had commanded the first corps when General John Reynolds was killed at Gettysburg. He would replace Doubleday with Newton, mainly because he didn't like Doubleday. And Newton would command the first corps during the 11 days. In the center, um, seated second from the right, is General William Hayes, who was a relatively unknown general officer even today who would take over the second corps after General Winfield Scott Hancock was wounded on the third day at Gettysburg. 
General Hayes would command the Second Corps during these 11 days. None of these officers was overly impressive in their resumes or in their conduct, their abilities as generals, uh, which would hamper me to some extent because he had lost General Hancock, a very capable officer, General Reynolds, another very capable officer, and General Sickles, who while not one of Meade's favorites was certainly an aggressive and a very popular Corps commander. So one of the questions that we asked in the book was, why these three officers, as opposed to other officers who had displayed uh, very good performances at Gettysburg. But these were three officers that Meade would choose, and they were not going to be of much help to him during the pursuit of Lee's army. This is a, a, another uh, Forbes drawing, watercolor, of the perceived Confederate lines at Williamsport. Lee was able to put together a a hodgepodge of about 11 mile uh, defensive position. And he only had roughly 40 to 45,000 men capable of defending it. So he had his army stretched very thin, which is the, was another reason why General Meade was expected to engage Lee because his army was gonna be so stretched out. But Meade was very concerned about General Lee's capability. He felt that Lee's army was still very dangerous he had felt he was outnumbered by Lee's army, which was not true, but he was very wary and very cautious and did not willingly want to attack any line that Lee established outside of Williamport while he was still trying to get his army safely across. This is just a, a, an artist's impression of the Confederate line. It was, it was a line which was fairly strong in some places and not strong in others. So it would be up to General Meade to try and find a weak point in that line, which he did to some extent. Uh, this is a, a Alfred Wild drawing of a Union uh, signalman, Signal Corps officer, uh, observing the Confederate lines, trying to make out what was happening and what Lee was doing and where his line was strong and where his line wasn't strong. To give you an idea that, that they would take over a top floor of buildings, the Signal Corps was very active during the pursuit in providing intelligence from direct observation of what Lee's army was doing. During the course of the pursuit, General uh, President Lincoln was very concerned that General Meade bring about another battle before Lee could escape. This is President Lincoln and his two secretaries. The one on the right is John Hay. Uh, he wrote, he kept a diary and reported uh, what was happening during this time period to include a potential attack that General Meade had ordered uh, for the 12th of July, which did not happen and which disappointed, certainly disappointed the president. Um, General Meade shown here, would announce his, his attack was, he actually had ordered an attack for the 12th. What something caused him not to make that attack on the 12th. Instead, there was skirmishing. Uh, there was a lot of reorganization of his lines, but he did not attack. He announced to General Halleck on the 12th after getting his army into a defensive position, which was actually probably stronger than the Confederate position, that he would attack the following day, which was the 13th, unless something intervened. Well, something did intervene, and it was General Meade himself. On the evening of the 12th, after General Lee was basically in position around Williamsport uh, and moving his people and working on the bridge and moving what he could via the uh, two ferries, General Meade would report to General Halleck that he would attack on the 12th. General Meade called a council of his corps commanders and in a really odd meeting, simply because it's very difficult to make out exactly how it happened and exactly what happened, General Meade managed to convince his corps commanders to vote against making the attack the following day, yet came off, presented himself as the aggressive commander wanting to attack but that he really didn't have enough intelligence to make an attack without knowing exactly what he was getting into. So the results of this 
core commanders meeting council of war on the 12th was that Meade would not attack the following day, but would take the 13th and conduct more reconnaissance operations to see if he could find a weak point in the Confederate line. So that those were lost opportunities. The 12th and the 13th uh, were very lost opportunities when Meade was in position and could have at least made various pushes to see what was going on. If he was not going to attempt to cross the river he had bridging capabilities, but General Meade did not order those bridges to be built so he could move troops across the Potomac and try to cut off Lee's escape, which was something that Lee really feared uh, that, that Meade might do, but Meade did not do that. The thousands of Union prisoners of wars, their, their accounts reflect that they expected to be rescued. Unfortunately, that rescue never happened and they would spend the rest of the war or until they would be exchanged in prisoner war camps in the Confederacy. So the, the attack on the 13th, on the 12th, well, the morning attack on the 13th did not take place. Um, Meade sent a message about a day later to tell Halleck that he had not attacked and that his corps commanders had decided against it. General Halleck would send a reply saying, don't listen to your corps commanders, do not call council to war, you will attack Lee's army. So General Meade made plans to conduct a reconnaissance in force on the 14th. He would send four of his 21, 20, divi 20 divisions, four of his divisions forward on a reconnaissance to determine the strength and locations of Lee's army um, to see if they could conduct an attack at some point in the future. By the time this reconnaissance moved forward, General Lee had finished his pontoon bridge. The river had subsided enough that it could be forded at Williamsport. And beginning late on the 13th, uh, he would pull his troops out of the defensive position. General Stewart's troopers would move into those defensive positions to keep up the impression that Lee was still in his lines. And again, under a driving rain, Lee would successfully move his troops across the Potomac into the safety of West Virginia and then back into Virginia. A significant accomplishment on Lee's part, a huge disappointment to President Lincoln. There would be some fighting uh, at Falling Waters this depicts the cavalry engagement between Custer's cavalry and the Confederate rear guard. Uh, the Union troopers came off worse for wear. Uh, a few capture, a uh, few prisoners were captured. Confederate prisoners were captured. And a number of artillery pieces, a small number, which were disabled and lost their lost their carriages, their wheels. Uh, but basically, Lee pulled his army out and successfully uh, withdrew his army intact. From across the Potomac from the bridgehead from the defensive position at uh, Williamsport. President Lincoln was extremely disappointed. He would write a letter to uh, General Meade on the 14th expressing his disappointment. Uh, he wrote the letter, he thought about it, he decided not to send the letter. We do have the letter, We you can read the letter. Uh, it's, I believe it's in the book. And he never sent it. He put it in an envelope and wrote letter to General Meade, not sent. Uh, but G uh, President Lincoln was very, very disappointed that Meade had not brought Lee to battle and that he had not possibly uh, been able to win the war, end the war with the surrender of General Lee if he was trapped and could not, be, could not escape from Williamsport. Uh, Lee envisioned, uh, General Lee, President Lincoln envisioned that this was certainly possible, but it had not happened, much to his disappointment. The rest of 1863 would basically be maneuvering um, General Meade trying to find a good position from which to attack or defend against an attack from General Lee, General Lee looking for the opportunity to again attack General Meade's army. Lee's army was significantly depleted that summer when he would send General Longstreet's Corps south to help General Bragg and would participate in the Battle of Chickamauga. 
but uh, no significant union activity would take place until this general, Ulysses S. Grant, moved east to assume command of the Union armies, and he would travel basically with the Army of the Potomac for the rest of the war um, in almost tactical command of General Meade's army. General Meade would remain in command, but basically acted almost as the chief of staff to General Grant. But Meade would remain in command of the army throughout the war and would be in command when the war ended. This is the equestrian statue of General Meade at Gettysburg. Meade's legacy was damaged during these 11 days. Uh, he had, there was great hope for him after the Battle of Gettysburg that he would be able to again meet and engage and defeat General Lee. Uh, General Meade simply was too cautious and too hesitant. He was not certain of himself and he would pay the price during the 11 days when he was unsuccessful in preventing Lee from crossing and unsuccessful in inflicting further damage on Lee's army. So his legacy after Gettysburg was impaired and he is, and that's part of the reason why he is basically an unknown commander considering that the battle of Gettysburg was fought and won under his command. I would like to close with a little example of President Lincoln's humor, which he maintained in some of the worst times during a very tragic war and, and time in American history. He always managed to maintain his sense of humor. And he kind of gave us an idea of how he felt about the pursuit and what happened during these 11 days. And not long after the Battle of Gettysburg, he met General Meade in Washington, D.C. when Meade went back for uh, conferences, for discussions in Washington. And when they met, President Lincoln said, do you know, General, Mr. Lincoln suddenly broke out with a laugh, what your attitude toward Lee for a week after the Battle of Gettysburg reminded me of? No, Mr. President, what is it, asked Meade. I could think of nothing else, said Lincoln, than an old woman trying to shoe her geese across the creek, which gives us a kind of an insight, not only as a humor, but how Mr. Lincoln felt about what had happened during the 11 fateful days after the Battle of Gettysburg. Historians would discuss this. We include a number of historians, their accounts, their beliefs, what they wrote about these days uh, and I would encourage you, if you're interested in this subject or want to know what happened after the Battle of Gettysburg, um, please read the book. Uh, we work very hard on it, and we hope you, would, you will enjoy it. And I would like to thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you tonight. Uh, and that concludes my presentation. And thank you so much. Uh, that was very, uh, very insightful, very detailed full of so much information. And I think we've got some questions coming in already. Uh, the first question, and I think you may have addressed this later on, but do you know specifically to which uh, prisons in Richmond uh, the uh, Confederate prisoners were taken? Um, or the Union prisoners, rather, I'm sorry. The about Union that. prisoners, the Union POWs, um, I think they spent, uh, a number of them were taken to Libby prison. Uh, but considering the number of four to 5,000, they were probably scattered over a number of uh, various prison camps and locations. But I think some of them did, uh, did end up in Libby. Uh, there were a number of accounts we looked at which would have uh, identified where they went, but just offhand, I don't recall where they were. Uh, there are some excellent accounts. Uh, one thing I noted in doing the research for the book there are a lot of sources that were untapped that I had not seen anything about. So it, it was a wealth of information out there. Some of it in just a paragraph or a sentence that provided a little bit of insight. But I was surprised that there were so many accounts that simply had not been utilized by other historians in discussing the period, that period after Gettysburg. But I'm not sure. Libby Prison was one of those. And um, they were taken to uh, probably to basically every POW camp that was operating at the time. 
Thank you. And I know the officers uh, tended to go to Libby and enlisted men to Belle Isle, but I, th I think you're correct. I think they probably went to other points further south too. Someone has asking, what was the one day of the 11 that was the most optimal for me to have attacked Lee? Oh, that's a great question. It would have been the 12th or the 13th of July, probably the 12th. Um, by that time, Meade had basically his entire army, which had been reinforced, unlike Lee, who only received maybe a couple of regiments that actually crossed in from, uh, who had made the march from Winchester and Martinsburg and actually got to uh, Williamsport. But the 12th and the 13th, I have always considered they were the lost days. Meade was in position. He had told Washington he was going to attack on the 12th and didn't. I was unable to find out any specific reason, but orders for the attack were actually read to various troops in the Union Army on the evening of the 11th. And if Meade notified Washington that he would attack, uh, certainly he had every intention to. Why he didn't, I'm not sure, and I never found a definitive reason. On the 13th, um, he could also have, his, his army was as strong as it was gonna be, uh, he knew, believed that Lee had a bridge uh, across and would be crossing even before the bridge actually was completed. Uh, Meade had been informed that there was a bridge. This came from Confederate POWs who had a really good habit of providing uh, erroneous information that would be believed by Union troops. So uh, they, they had a good thing. So Meade being very hesitant simply was not willing to commit to an attack. Um, he would later say that the actual, the actual course that should have been taken was basically the one he did, that they should have driven Lee from Pennsylvania and Maryland and then regrouped, uh, rebuilt the army, and then crossed back into Virginia in pursuit of Lee's army, as opposed to what Mr. Lincoln wanted, felt that Lee was most vulnerable at Williamsport, which was true, because he was still trying to get his army across and he was still threatened by, Lee, uh, by General Meade's army. The, the 12th and the 14th were the two days that I believe personally that if Meade had launched a serious attack, uh, it probably would have been, it could have been a disaster for General Lee. And I have seen there are a number of accounts from the Union rank and file who agree with me on that. For once in, in reporting, the Union troops, they were willing to, and they desperately wanted another shot at Lee. Um, they, were, they were emboldened. They were uh, very built up by the victory at Gettysburg, and they saw the opportunity, and they did not want to have to follow Lee back into Virginia and fight in Virginia. They thought they had an opportunity, but General Meade didn't give them the opportunity. They felt they would. A number of Meade's commanders also felt they would. And the 12th and the 13th were the two days that I think, uh, I call them the lost days of, of those 11 days. Excellent. And uh, Pat says that she has read your Confederate tactics and looks forward to reading this one and wants to know, how did you choose this topic? Well, Tom and I met a number of years ago at Gettysburg during one of the seminars that was held by the Park Service. And we became friends and Tom wrote an excellent book um, called Spy Scouts and Secrets of the Gettysburg Campaign, uh, which primarily dealt with the intelligence aspect, which we cover uh, Colonel Sharp and his BMI and the intelligence that General Meade was receiving. Um, Tom wrote that book, and we had talked about getting together and writing a book. The problem is, of course, Gettysburg, basically everything has been written about the Battle of Gettysburg. There are books I've got in my own library, um, just shelf after shelf of Gettysburg titles. But as, when we looked into the possibility, uh, we realized that there was very little written from the Union aspect, from General Meade's aspect and the Union Army of the Potomac about the days after the battle and prior to 
uh, General, Mee, uh, General Lee's recrossing of the Potomac River. You'll find bits and pieces, but nothing, uh, no detail, no comprehensive account of what happened. Uh, why wasn't Meade able to uh, take advantage of this great victory, especially when, the, when Mother Nature conspired against General Lee, who admitted that if everything had gone the way it was supposed to, he'd have had his army safely across. But now, because of the river being so swollen and his bridge being destroyed, mostly destroyed, he was unable to cross, and he would have to, he expected to have to fight another battle um, with Meade following and being and attacking him. This was expected. And we, we wondered why this hasn't been covered. Uh, Kent Brown, as I mentioned, covered it very well in retreat from Gettysburg, but that was from Lee's standpoint. So we wanted to look at it and thought there was a gap in um, Gettysburg campaign uh, literature of these 11 days. And so we decided to cover it. And we also covered newspaper accounts from both North and South, accounts from the Union prisoners of war. So there's a lot more in the book that I wasn't able to talk about tonight that uh, you just won't find in any other account other than maybe a couple of sentences or a paragraph. And that includes some of the more well-known books about Gettysburg, Coddington um, and, uh, and others who have written about the battle. So we felt that we, filled in a gap in the campaign. And a question from Susie, do you think there was a quote winner at Gettysburg? At, at the Battle of Gettysburg, the battle itself? Um, I assume yes. Okay, traditionally the winner was the army that was left on the field at the time. And whoever retreated was the loser. Um, certainly Lee's casualties were heavy. He was unable to break Meade's line after two days of fighting the second and the third in the fish hook position. And the first day um, when uh, Ewell's, Ewell's Corps and Hill's Corps um, caused, attacked and defeated the 1st and 11th Union Army Corps on the first day and they retreated to the well-known position at Gettysburg. Um, in terms of the real, the real outcome of the battle, considering that Meade was on, def on the defensive for the, all three days, his casualties were probably slightly larger than General Lee's casualties. And Lee was the aggressor, was on the offensive for the three days. Usually, if you're in a good defensive position, you suffer fewer casualties. In this case, that wasn't true. Now, a lot of those casualties were prisoners taken in from the 1st and 11th Corps on the first day, but it was a Union victory, but it could have been much more, and there were some opportunities missed at Gettysburg, and certainly General Lee was impeded more by his high command uh, at Gettysburg, it was fairly dysfunctional. All three corps commanders uh, did not support Lee, in my opinion, as he needed to be supported at Gettysburg. So it was a Union victory, but it certainly did not change the course of the war. And the fact that Lee successfully recrossed his army, the, uh, what was left of his army, um, that he successfully crossed and did send a tremendous amount of supplies down there, took a lot of his wounded with him. You have to give Lee credit for turning Gettysburg into less of a victory than it could have been. And Christopher wants to know if there are any Civil War sites in Williamsport, Maryland today. Yes, there are. Um, the crossing point, basically a crossing point uh, where the for, where the ferry was and the uh, the ford at Williamsport, there is a National Park Service site there of the CNO Canal at Williamsport, and they cover what happened uh, at after Gettysburg, and actually s events that happened at Williamsport prior in the years prior to the battle in 1862. But that is a a good place to go. Um, the CNO Canal, they're working on that area. They've done a lot of work. There is a small visitor center you can take. You can travel the towpath 
uh, along the canal and you can walk down and get an idea. You can't get to where the pontoon bridge was at Falling Waters, but there are there was an excellent little museum in Williamsport. I don't know if it's still open. I visited it a number of years ago, but Williamsport, if you can, if it's in the area, is a is a nice place. It's a nice little town, and there there are a lot. There are markers, and the CNO Canal is well worth seeing there. Uh, so yeah, there is there there are enough sites at Williamsport to make it very interesting to include markers and uh, information at the at the CNO Canal at the small museum there about what happened after the Battle of Gettysburg. The state of Maryland has an excellent Civil War trails and they have markers throughout the area. And you can go online, uh, uh, Maryland and Civil War, and the, the pamphlets and that are available online. You can actually tour that. And Williamsport would be one of those tours. It's a good place. It's a nice place to visit. Thank you, that's great. Uh, and Neil uh, says, why did successive Union generals constantly overestimate the strength of Lee's army? Meade's predecessors did the um, Yeah. In General McClellan's case, he had um, a gentleman named Pinkerton running his intelligence operation. And Mr. Pinkerton's estimates of Confederate strength were always very high, overblown. Um, General Hooker had the same problem, even though his Colonel Sharp's Bureau of Mil Military Information was giving him very accurate order of battle, right down to regimental strengths, regiments with Lee's army. Part of it was a number of reports that General Meade wanted to believe came from civilians. And for civilians to see Lee's army marching through Maryland and into Pennsylvania at the end of June, they never seen that number of troops before. And to them, a company would look like a regiment. A regiment would look like a brigade. A brigade would look like a division. So they just saw thousands and thousands and just multiplied these numbers because they had never seen that number of troops before. And now they were seeing them going through their towns. Uh, so a lot of accounts that were being received by General Meade were, were way over. General Meade assumed one of his reports, he identified that General Lee had 92,000 infantry, just infantry, not cavalry, not artillery, 92,000 infantry when others and the more accurate BMI sources uh, would have him somewhere around 75,000, which was much more accurate in terms of Lee's actual numbers. Part of it is a commander believes what he wants to believe. And General Meade being cautious and being wary and being hesitant and under great pressure to attack General Lee, if he was outnumbered, it would give him the leeway to say, hey, I have to be careful. I've, I've got this huge army in Pennsylvania and I have to be very careful about what I do because Lee has 100,000 men. 100,000 is a standard figure about if you add the cavalry and the artillery, that Lee has 100,000 men. And General Meade would stick to that. When he testified before the Committee on the Conduct of the War in March of 64, he would identify that Lee's army had many more men than he did. And in fact, he was well re reinforced after Gettysburg. He didn't like the quality of some of the militia and the raw troops that he was being sent, but he did receive some veteran units and Lee received virtually no one and had to get an army across so he would be on the move and he would have to split his forces some across while they were crossing a river, which is extremely dangerous. One thing that I personally believe is that General Lee was a very audacious, aggressive commander. And what he was doing, he was not fighting or playing by the book. He was not as cautious, he was not as careful as he should be if he was if he had fewer men than they thought he had. So if Lee's army is smaller, he's not acting like it. They expected that what Lee was doing, taking, making an invasion 
in into Maryland, Pennsylvania, he must have at least 100,000 men if he's going to do this. So Lee, just simply being very aggressive and audacious, caused the Union authorities to think he was he was stronger than he actually was, simply because what he was doing was not going by the book. So those are those are a number of the reasons. And again, Meade's uh, assumption that Lee outnumbered him allowed him to be cautious and allowed actually helped uh, Lee uh, from a psychological standpoint be able to successfully get his army back into Virginia after Gettysburg. Those are some great observations about uh, civilian perspectives and also Lee's audacity. And we're going to end with one uh, last question and also uh, this is from Ron and he also makes the comment that uh, visiting falling waters uh, from the Maryland side of the crossing uh, is uh, a great thing to do. It's located in a nice recreation area. And he asks or, or comments that the 12th Corps General Slocum's after battle reports as well as General Williams reports uh, do not speak highly of me during those 12 days. Do you have a, a response or a comment on that? Uh, yeah, um, General Slocum was very upset by what G General Meade described in his official report written in October of 63. Um, Meade, in Slocum's opinion, did not do a service to the 12th Corps. Um, and he, Meade, simply according to what Williams and especially Slocum thought, he thought that uh, Meade had certainly not given credit to the, to the 12th Corps that they deserved at Gettysburg. Um, there was also some confusion regarding Slocum's uh, functioning as a wing commander at Gettysburg during the first day when he was based on the famous uh, circular that Meade put out on the first, that um, General Slocum would assume command of his 12th Corps and the 5th Corps, and uh, not the 5th Corps, and uh, yes, the 5th Corps, uh, if the circular was invoked. And supposedly General Slocum, General Slocum, Slocum believed that he had been made a wing commander at Gettysburg and put General Williams in charge of the 12th Corps while he was uh, the wing commander. But Slocum was very disappointed in uh, General Meade at Gettysburg because he felt that his corps was not given credit it was due. He also was very critical of General Meade regarding his corps commander's meeting that he held on the 12th. And he said that Meade made it look like his corps commanders actually wimped out for lack of a better term, that General Meade was willing to attack and he wanted to attack, but his corps commanders uh, just simply kept him from doing that. They forced him into a, to not to attack on the 12th. And Slocum was very upset. And he said that Meade actually manipulated um, the account, his account to make it, to put the blame on the corps commanders when he believed that General Meade should have, should have attacked. There was a, a letter that, um, Slocum wrote to a friend of his uh, early in 1864, in which he complained about me generally throwing his corps commanders under the bus in order to protect himself. So yes, there was um, certainly, uh, he had a chip on his shoulder about General Meade at Gettysburg and about how he treated his corps commanders during that time, during the pursuit prior to Lee crossing again. Well, thank you so much uh, for this excellent talk tonight. Thank uh, many thanks to those of you who attended tonight. And uh, you can always uh, buy this book. You can go to the Savas Beattie website to do that or uh, to Amazon, I'm pretty sure, too. Uh, and uh, please go to our website, acwm.org, for more information on programs. Thank you all. Have a good evening. Thank you very much for the opportunity.